there everybody, welcome to ITTV. For today's lesson, we're still on reproduction and growth, but we're focusing on um, growth in multicellular organisms and their growth curves. Okay, let's look at the necessity for growth in organisms. Now, growth is permanent and non-reversible in organisms. It involves changes from the time of zygote until adulthood. So you can see there's a very cute cartoon diagram that all of us actually started off as babies, toddlers, you know, um, you know, we were adolescents, teenagers, and then finally we become adults. So, the non-reversible increase happens in body size, mass, and number of cells in an organism. Changes in shape, function, and complexity associate with specialization. So, of course, um, what happens throughout our growth process will be changes in body size, the mass, our weight, um, number of cells as well. So it's important that sometimes throughout the peak growing years that we actually uh, monitor and track our weight as well as our height. Whether are we achieving that uh, you know, um, a normal median of um, the weight and the height for our BMI. Now growth is divided into three phases. Firstly, cell division which is an increase in the number of cells, B cell elongation, where, which involves increase in the volume of the cell, and lastly, the last phase will be cell differentiation, whereby there's a specialization of cell according to the function. So these are the three phases for all multicellular organisms, which will be cell division, elongation, and differentiation. So let's look at the first one, which is cell division, the first phase. In this phase, number of cells in an organism increases by mitosis. Each division involves formation of cells that are identical to the parent cell. One cell divides, forming two cells, followed by formation of four, eight, and until the mass of cells, which consists of many identical cells. So what happens is that in cell division, it's purely by mitosis, whereby all the daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent cell. So it's sort of like, um, you know, um, very fast. It goes from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. Now, what about cell elongation, the second phase of, um, the second phase of growth? So, for cell elongation, this involves an increase in size and volume of cells through intake of water and nutrients into cells by osmosis and diffusion. Accumulation of water in plant vacuoles causes the primary wall to stretch. Nutrients used to build up protoplasm increases the size of the cell. So, as you can see, cell elongation is not an increase in volume, but increase in size. And how does the cell increase in size? Well, of course, it has to take up water as well as, as, well as nutrients into the cell. That's why this happens through osmosis and perhaps through diffusion. So, with that, what happens is that the primary walls will stretch and, of course, uh, nutrients that will build up the protoplasm will also increase the size of the cell. Now, the last phase of the growth stage will be cell differentiation. So, cells differentiate from other cells and they become specialized with specific functions. For example, differentiation in the epidermis of roots, which involve development of hair-like outgrowths. This gives large surface area for water absorption from the soil. So, if you refer to the diagram, um, at this point, the cells will start to differentiate from each other for their different specialized functions. So, you can see that there is a picture of a root and there are small root areas to increase the total surface area over volume ratio for water absorption. And we have um, next another diagram that shows you um, some plant cells that there is a plane of cell division which is tangential and um, there is formation as you can see of a secondary xylem vessel 
Now, usually, secondary phloem are accompanied with companion cells that are rich in organelles because phloem are basically dead cells. And you can see that the phloem is actually made up of, you know, um, sieve tube member cells and even a companion cell is actually part of the phloem. So um, what happens is that initially you have some like parenchyma cells which are undifferentiated cells and you have colonchyma, sclerenchyma and later on they will just slowly differentiate into their specialized cells. Now besides that, certain epidermal cells in leaves which transform into guard cells, they aid the plants to regulate water loss from the leaves. Now do you remember our much previous lessons about stomata opening and closure during the day and the night respectively? That this is um, caused by either you know, um, you know, osmosis process whereby it involves the movement of water into the guard cells or out of the guard cells you know, entry and exit of potassium ions into and out of the gut cells that influences the opening and the closure of the stomata. So what happens is that some epidermal epidermal cells, they can actually differentiate into guard cells to actually, you know, control and regulate water loss from the leaves. So that's the beauty of cell differentiation. That's why, um, like for example, in the human scenario, we have stem cells and the most powerful of these are embryonic stem cells, which they are not, uh, not uh, specialized yet, but they have the ability to differentiate into different, different cells of the body, from cartilage cell, bone cell, skin cell, anything, muscle cell. So that's the power of the embryonic stem cell. Now let us look at something else, the parameters in measuring growth. Now growth in organisms can be estimated by measuring some parameters over a period of time, such as size, volume, dry mass or fresh mass. We don't call it wet mass anymore, but we call it fresh mass, which is opposite of the dry mass. On the other hand, appropriate parameters must be used according to the growth of the organism. For example, in humans, growth can be measured in increase of height over a period of time. So as we can see, we will know, like how, how what do we mean when we say that Susie is growing? That means she's growing in height. That is more for the human perspective. Usually growth is measured in terms of height. Um, well, of course, there is of course um, growth laterally sideways, which can be measured through differences in weight. But of course, when a person grows taller, the weight also will increase. So weight is not a very accurate, uh, accurate measurement of growth in humans. But we often say height is a better measurement of growth in humans. Now, but the same parameter which is of height is not suitable to measure growth of a tree. So you see, when we want to know whether a tree or a plant is growing, it's not suitable to measure the height of a tree because some trees, they are that small, they are meant to be shrubs, but they can still be growing in other ways known as secondary growth, which we will look later at the next few lessons. So, increase in size or volume. This is the first parameter to measure the growth in an organism, size or volume. This refers to either the height or length of an organism over a period of time. The advantages would be two. Firstly, easy and fast to be carried out. B, there is no requirement to kill the organism. The disadvantages would be the growth is measured in only one dimension and the other dimensions such as weight and diameter are not taken into account. Now of course we know that measuring the height of an organism of a human or a, or even um, you know of a dog is simple because there's no need to kill the organism of course and it's a very uh, fast, easy, convenient way to carry it out. However, we know that it may not be accurate especially for certain organisms because growth is measured in one dimension only. Now, so even when we uh, measure, right, increase in size or volume, we want to um, make it more accurate and thereby comes another parameter to measure growth in an organism which is dry mass. Now, it refers to the mass of an organism after all the moisture has been removed from the body. 
The mean advantage, which is pretty important, will be to measure the accurate amount of organic matter. So of course, dry mass is what we can say the most accurate way to measure and to track the growth of an organism. However, it comes with a whole host of disadvantages. For example, the organism has to be killed. Secondly, large number of organisms are required to measure the change in growth. And thirdly, as a result, growth of the same organism cannot be taken. Now, although measurement of dry mass is so accurate, but the organism has to be killed. So how then can we track and monitor the growth of that same organism if we had already killed it? But of course, maybe just for short term kind of um, monitoring, we just want to know what is the uh, growth of that organism after a certain period. And um, the disadvantage of dry mass is because after all the moisture has been taken off, usually large number of organisms are needed to measure the change in growth. Because the same organism has died, so we need to take another organism and then later on another organism to monitor a longer period of growth. Thereby comes the fourth parameter in the measurement of growth, which is fresh mass growth. Now, this refers to mass of living organisms without removal of moisture content from the body. So the advantages would be, be easy and convenient to be carried out, there is no requirement to kill the organism, and the growth of the organism can be measured continuously. However, the disadvantages would be it's not accurate as the measurement is affected by the presence of the amount of water in the body. So of course, fresh mass is easy, it's convenient, we don't have to kill the organism, we don't need large amounts of organism because we can track the growth of the very same organism over a long period of time. However, the disadvantage, which is quite bad actually, is that um, it's just not accurate because um, the fresh mass is really dependent on the amount of water in the body. If the person has not drunk a, a big amount of water, then the fresh mass would be different. Or if let's say the person has just drunk um, many cups of water, then the fresh mass would of course be much greater. So it's just not accurate and maybe not a very good representation of um, the growth of an organism. So with that, let us come to analysing growth curves. So growth curves are formed by plotting parameters such as length, height, fresh mass or dry mass against time. So we have an S-shaped or sigmoid curve and it is the common shape curve for growth of population of microorganisms, individual organisms or plants and animals. So as you can see, please refer with me to the graph that this graph of growth curve is usually, it could be either length, height, fresh mass or dry mass, but this graph is height in centimeters versus time in years from 0 to 80 years. This is generally tracking the growth of boys and girls. So we have different phases of the growth period. As you can see, it is delineated as KLM and an O. Firstly, let's look at the infant phase, which is known as K. Now, the growth rate is rapid for both boys and girls. But L, childhood phase, the growth rate is slower. <clears throat> growth rate is higher for boys from the age of 4 compared to girls. So as you can see in infant phase, right, which is from 0 to 4, toddler age, that uh, the growth rate for boys and girls are equally fast. So that's why you can notice the blue line which is for girls and the red line that is for boys, they almost intercept, they almost overlap from 0 to 4 years of age. But after 4, 4 to 10 years of age, which is known as the childhood phase, the growth rate is higher for boys, especially from 4 years old onwards. Now, 
A dolphin face, as you can see, denoted with the letter M, growth rate is very rapid. Early part of phase, a rapid growth is seen in girls as they start two years earlier than boys. This is because girls attain puberty at the age between 10 to 12 years of age. So as you can see, if you observe carefully in the graph of a period M, that girls actually have, um, have a more rapid growth period, especially from 10 to 12 years of age because they attain puberty between age 10 to 12. But boys, they later pick up from age of perhaps 10 to 20 onwards, you can notice that um, the growth period for boys is much more rapid. Later part of the phase, a rapid growth is seen in boys compared to girls as boys attain puberty around age of 14. So it's understood that boys actually attain puberty a little bit later, roughly about two years later. But your voices will start to crack a little bit, you know, as they attain a much deeper voice. So with that, let us look at the adult phase. Growth rate is seen to be zero as maturity is reached. Girls achieve this phase early, around 18 years, while various boys achieve this phase at around age 20. So as you can see in this adult phase, we are considered as adults from age 18 onwards to age 70 that um, they don't grow anymore as in, um, in terms of height because the measurement parameter here is height that girls and boys they don't grow any, any much taller. Well, for girls especially, after the age of 18, they don't grow um, any more taller but for boys they still can actually grow a little bit taller at about um, well until before age 20 um, as long as the long bones uh, of the body are not fused yet then um, the person will have the ability to grow even taller and last really we look at the aging phase O now the growth rate is negative or decreasing because the muscles and cartilage of the body starts to degenerate due to aging about age 70. So often when a person is about age 70, uh, we notice that the person is aging um, and is achieving senescence. So in this case here, the muscles, cartilage will start to degenerate and uh, we would say that the growth rate, the graph as you notice is starting to dip actually for both the boys and the girls, whereby girls, um, well of course, they, they had already achieved um, a shorter height, right, and therefore they will grow actually even a bit shorter, perhaps um, if especially osteoporosis sets in, and then it will be more detrimental in terms of the height that they can actually decrease by 15 centimeter every year. So that was for humans. Let's look at the growth curves of insects. Now, growth curves for insects are not smooth, but interrupted. Invertebrates, such as grasshoppers, cockroaches, prawns and crabs, they show a different growth curve as they have a hard exoskeleton made of chitin. So it's rather interesting to refer to the growth curve of insects. The graph is um, size versus time. Size meaning perhaps they actually measure perhaps the length of the invertebrate. Then you notice that it's not a very smooth um, curve, but it's like a staircase. Let's analyze the graph. In order for growth to happen, insects need to shed their old exoskeleton so that a new larger one can be replaced in a process called ecdysis. In this process, insects expand their body by breathing in a lot of air. This makes the old exoskeleton to break. Insects then come out of the broken exoskeleton and they breathe in more air to expand its body before the new exoskeleton ha hardens. This process continues until the maximum size of the insect is achieved. So as you can see, um, insects, they actually mold. They actually undergo a process called molting, whereby when they are going to increase in size, they breathe in a lot of air, this breaks the old exoskeleton, they crawl out of the old exoskeleton, and then of course there's this new exoskeleton being formed, um, already being formed, and they just breathe in more air, and then they expand their body, 
before the new exoskeleton forms. So that's how actually all these invertebrates actually that's how they grow in size. So basically, the growth curve of insects is unique and has a staircase shape. The horizontal part indicates zero growth. The time between ecdysis, which is known as instar. And the vertical part indicates ecdysis and growth. So if you're wondering what instar means, it's basically the time between ecdysis. And if you recall what ecdysis is, ecdysis is the time needed for the insects to remove their old exoskeleton and replace it with a larger one. That's a process called ecdysis. So the part where they breathe in air, break off old exoskeleton, come out of old exoskeleton, breathe in more air, harden exoskeleton, that's a period called instar. And that's why there is no growth, zero growth, because it's still the same size. And after instar, then they assume a larger size. So, that ends our theory part for basically the, you know, we looked at the growth in multicellular organisms and the growth curve. So, let us look at a few questions, alright? Question 1. Which of these is true about human growth curve? A. Growth rate is zero during adolescence as maturity is reached. B. Infant phase shows slow growth rate for boys and girls. C. Negative growth as degeneration of muscles and cartilage starts during aging. And growth rate is high in girls compared to boys during childhood. Now, I'd like you to take time out to think what the answer would be, and I'll unveil the answer soon. Aha! Uh -huh. Let's run through the options and we'll see which is our answer. Growth rate is zero during adolescence as maturity is reached. Now this is obviously not true because if you're following very closely with the lesson, during adolescence, well, it would be like maybe from 10 years onwards, from 10 to 18 years. From the age of 10 to 18 years, how can growth rate be zero? That's during aging. During adolescence, if you notice, from 10 to 12 years of age, girls actually they girls actually achieve a much uh, faster growth rate right from 10 to 12 because they achieve puberty earlier but um, by age 14 boys they actually uh, experience spurts in growth because that's when they achieve puberty so for girls 10 to 12 guys age 14 so during adolescent growth rate is rapid it's not zero it's initially faster for girls but later on, guys catch up. Infant phase shows low growth rate for boys and girls. Now that's obviously not true. Infant phase is from the age of, well, I would say probably from um, 0 to 4. Now, for the infant phase, what happens is that if you notice for the infant phase, um, I would say that at this point here, the growth rate is rapid for both boys and girls, okay? So it's not true because at the infant phase, growth phase is rapid for boys and girls. Now, how about C, negative growth, as degeneration of muscles and cartilage happen during aging. Now that's spot on. So the answer is obviously C. But let's have a look at D and why it's wrong. Growth rate is high in girls compared to boys during childhood. Now, during childhood, I would say that growth rate is, um, is uh, higher for the boys, right? So for growth rate um, during childhood, if you notice during childhood, what happens would be that uh, growth rate is higher from boys from age 4 onwards because childhood is from 4 to 10 and boys actually experience uh, higher growth rates um, from 4 to 10 as compared to girls. So it's obviously incorrect. That's why the answer for question 1 is C. That negative growth happens during aging because of degeneration of muscles and cartilage. 
Question 2. Which of these is not true about cell elongation? There is increase in size and volume of cells by osmosis and diffusion. B. Higher length of an organism over a period of time. And C. Accumulation of water in plant vacuoles cause the primary wall to stretch. And D. Nutrients are used to build up protoplasm that increases the size of the cell. Now, it might be quite tricky, so do carefully think of the answer. Now, which of this is false? Let's run through our options. A. Increase in size and volume of cells by osmosis and diffusion. That's true. Because of osmosis of water, diffusion of nutrients into the cells, then the cell elongates. Because there are three phases in cell growth, which would be... Yes, you're right. It would be basically you have, um, um, you know, cell... Um, if you recall, what are the three different phases of cells? I will mention. Okay, you're right. Yes, firstly, you have cell division. Then we have cell um, elongation. And then cell differentiation. So let me repeat that. Cell division, cell elongation, and cell differentiation. Okay? So what happens here? is that uh, A is true. B. Higher length of an organism over a period of time. Now, that's not true. That's not true about cell elongation um, because uh, that is not the properties of cell elongation. So, how about C? Accumulation of water in plant vacuoles causes the primary wall to stretch. Now, that's perfectly fine. That is cell elongation. And the nutrients are used to build up the protoplasm protoplasm that increases the size of cell. Protoplasm refers to the organelles and the cytoplasm and that is spot on. So the answer for this is B, that it is false about cell elongation. Now next question, which of these best describes the advantages of dry mass? A measures the accurate amount of organic matter, B the organism has to be killed, C large number of organisms required in measuring growth, and the growth of the same organism cannot be taken again. Aha! Now this question, if um, on first glance, it looks like all are correct. But look carefully. The question wants best, best are. Yes. Okay, I'm sure that if, um, if you had really taught through the question, if you had chosen option A, well done! Fantastic! Because the one that best describes the advantages, because we're talking about the advantages and not about, um, not about the disadvantages. So the only advantage of dry mass, which is quite powerful, is the ability to measure the accurate amount of organic matter. But the disadvantage would be option B, C, D. That the organism has to be killed, large numbers of organisms are needed in measuring growth, and lastly, the same organism's growth cannot be taken again because it's already killed. So that's why A is the advantage. Now, moving on. Which of these is false about the parameters of growth? Fresh mass. A. Easy and convenient to be carried out. B. There's requirement to kill the organism. C. Growth of the organism can be measured continuously. D. Not accurate as measurement is affected by amount of water in the body. So, just think true and I'll show you the answer soon. Now, it's always very important, students, that in the exam, you have to read the question properly and understand what does the question want. Now, the keyword for this question is parameter. What is not true about the parameter of fresh mass? So, firstly, A. Is it easy and convenient to be carried out? Sure thing, because, you know, you don't have to kill the organism. So, that's precisely why B is wrong. There is a requirement to kill the organism is obviously wrong. C. 
proof of the organism can be measured continuously. Now, we know that this is obviously true because there's no need to kill the organism. Now, it's already true that the answer is option B, but I'm trying to run through option C and D, and I hope that you will be able to spot out um, the mistake or perhaps why it is true, right? So D, uh, measuring fresh mass is not accurate. Yes, that's true. That is the disadvantage, the only disadvantage of fresh mass, but it's a major disadvantage because when we measure something, we want our values to be accurate. So if measurement of fresh mass is not accurate, why? Because the measurement is affected by the amount of water that the person has consumed. So option A, C, D are correct, true. That leaves out only option B. Now, let's look at question 5. Growth is considered as and as in organisms. Growth is alternate, reversible, permanent, non-reversible. Now, this one I didn't really mention in the theory part, but it's kind of like common sense after, you know, it's a bit of application based on what you've learned. Think about it, boys and girls. Well, if you've chosen um, option D, well done, superb effort because we know that growth is definitely permanent and it's not reversible. If we grow taller, can we grow any shorter? No, right? Um, but of course, if a person has grown plumper, they can grow thinner. But growth in humans are usually measured in height. So if you're taller, you can't grow any shorter. So growth is permanent and non-reversible. Let's look at some essay questions perhaps. Okay, so firstly, describe cell elongation. Now this is quite a popular exam question because sometimes students they mistake between cell elongation, division and differentiation. So I want you to be very clear about it. You should be writing in your exam that cell elongation involves an increase in size and volume of cells through intake of water and nutrients in the cell by osmosis and diffusion respectively. Accumulation of water in the plant vacuoles causes the primary wall to stretch and nutrients used to build up protoplasm increases the size of the cell. So if you've gotten all these key points here, well done. And this answer is meant for cell elongation in plant cells. Let's move on to the last question. Describe human growth curve and the three phases involved. Now this could be a potential essay question. Okay, so I hope that your answer would have all these key points. You should say that the growth curve for insects are not smooth but interrupted. Invertebrates uh, show a different growth curve as they have a hard exoskeleton made of chitin. The hard exoskeleton obstructs the growth of these insects. And in order for growth to happen, insects need to shed their old exoskeleton so that a new larger one can be replaced in a process called ecdysis. In this process, insects expand their body by breathing in a lot of air. This makes the old exoskeleton to break. Insects then come out of the broken exoskeleton and breathes in more air to expand its body before the new exoskeleton hardens. The process continues until the maximum size of the insect is achieved. The growth curve of insects is unique and has a staircase shape. The horizontal part indicates zero growth, the time between ecdysis, which is known as instar. The vertical part indicates ecdysis and growth. So I hope that you've put all these major points inside and with that, we've ended our lesson for today. So, thank you so much for watching ITTV. We hope that you had a better understanding of, you know, growth curves and so on. So, we hope that you have a wonderful day and take care.